Robert Taylor, and I welcome you to this afternoon's Artist Talk, sponsored by the Art Committee here at Kendall at Oberlin. We want to begin with big thank yous to Mary Bame for hosting the Zoom, and to Jonathan Inton for putting it onto Kendall's in-house television channel, KOTV. We have six very special guests with us today to talk about the show that is currently hanging in the Kendall Gallery called LGBTQ Artists of Northeast Ohio. This is one of the satellite shows that we have here each year in collaboration with the Artists Archives of the Western Reserve in Cleveland. Mindy Towsley, the Executive Director of the Archives is here with us and will introduce the rest of the guests to you. But first, let me give a special warm welcome to those of you from outside Kendall at Oberlin who have joined us on this Zoom. We're delighted you're here and please feel free to join in the discussion that will begin after the artists have made their remarks. Speaking of which, we'd like that discussion to be a person to person conversation. So here's what we'll do. While our guests are talking, please be sure that those of you who are on Zoom are muted to keep extraneous noises from interrupting their remarks. But then afterward, if you'd like to speak, unmute yourself and ask your question or give your comment. Then please mute yourself again during the response. If someone else begins speaking just ahead of you, please wait for your next opportunity. It should all work out just fine. Those of you watching on TV can't ask questions, of course, but you'll be able to enjoy the discussion anyway. And now here is Mindy Towsley. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Um, actually seated to my left is one of the artists, um, Mark Howard, who is gonna talk with you today. I just wanted to make sure you, <laughs> that's who was sitting next to me. Um, I'd like to thank Kendall very much. You know, I think we've been doing these shows with Kendall for maybe four years now. And um, it's been a great collaboration uh, working with Robert and the whole exhibition committee has been fantastic. And it's really a way for us to get our collection out into the public eye. Um, we are a regional museum. Um, our mission is to collect the work of Ohio artists specifically and make it available through exhibitions and programs um, just like this one and like the exhibition at Kendall. And our, um, our collection to date is uh, 10,000 works by 89 artists. So it's quite large. And our gallery space is quite small. You can see the gallery behind me, we're in between shows. So there's just some uh, photographs by Stuart Pearl, who is a newly archived artist. And he will be the next exhibition opening here. Uh, we will do an in-person opening Friday on uh, the 21st. Um, so our artists today are uh, Tom Rose, Mark Howard, and Arnie Tunstall. And um, I also would like to introduce uh, Megan Alves, if she is on. Um, she is our manager of programming and marketing. And um, she might have herself muted, but, you know, she's here with us. Um, the show that you guys have at Kendall is actually um, a small kind of satellite show which was part of the Converge exhibition. Um, that was a very large exhibition that we did starting in August, running through the beginning of November of 2021. And it was the LGBTQ uh, plus artists from the Western Reserve. Um, it went into five venues and I'm not gonna say anything more about it um, because um, the next person I'm gonna introduce to you is Kelly Pontoni, who is our collections registrar. And Kelly acted as the chief curator for the show along with three other curators. And uh, so she's got a great slideshow for you that she's gonna show you and talk a little bit about Convert. Um, so I think I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly. I'm gonna mute myself. And, um, and, thank and you while again. you're muting yourself, let's ask everyone else to mute oh. themselves as well. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> Great, thank you, Mindy. Um, and thank you also, Robert. Um, it's, it was such a pleasure and I was so excited to hear that you were interested in um, doing a little mini satellite from um, you know, our large exhibition. Um, so thank you so much and thank you for, to Kendall. So yes, Converge was a large exhibition. It was, 70 artists, five venues, over 150 pieces, and it was one exhibition. Um, and I just have to thank Mindy and Megan because there is only three of us. And 
I think I have to say that because what I've done is when I was thinking about show, what to show you, I kind of wanted to give you a little taste of everything that happened. It started about a year ago, um, the planning. And when I looked at my photos, I have over 800 photos. Don't worry, I'm not going to show you all 800. But what I've done is I put this little video together um, and it's under six minutes and I'm going to talk through it. And it has about 170 images. So I'm going to talk and it's not going to line up with the images, but you're really going to get to see some um, behind the scenes stuff of the planning. And then um, once the art was up and the different venues. So the venues were Lake Erie College, Metro Health Hospital, the LGBTQ Center of Greater Cleveland, Judson Manor, and Lake Erie. So it was kind of spread, you know, throughout the city. Um, so I'm going to start this. And I'm just going to talk a little bit. Um, like I said, it was a lot of planning and it started a year ago in January when we were looking at venues and gathering. These are the curators. We're gathering the curators. I had Tony Williams, Mark Yazinchek, Sam Butler, and Mary Proctor. And we started looking at art and looking at artists and going to their studios and seeing what we wanted for all five of these um, venues and how we were going to sort through, you know, the art and what we wanted to show Cleveland. Um, so, you know, these are a lot of the pictures of going to different studios and seeing different things. Some of the images were in the show and some of them weren't. Um, one big thing was, um, we were very, very conscious of diversifying the exhibit. We wanted to really look at age and gender and um, really be, you know, the identity of everyone. Those pictures were from Pride. This was the first time that the artist archives were participated in Cleveland's Pride Festival. Um, it was a parade because of COVID. And um, it was really, it was so much fun. Um, and as I looked at all of these photos, even with the photos with the people with masks on, there was so many people that were just smiling, even though it was tons of work. Um, this was install pictures and, you know, Mindy was amazing. She installed and we installed so much, but you can see there, like we were just so happy. Um, and then on the sidelines, Megan Elves, she came up with these amazing programs that were on Zoom. Um, we had a program about art and AIDS. We had um, a program about the history of drag. We had partnered with MOCA of Cleveland and we did a program with two programs with them. And she just, she came up with these really spectacular speakers and um, panel discussions. Um, and then a big part of the show, I wanted to touch on AIDS. So that was my thought with, you know, approaching Metro Health Hospital because I knew that they in the past had exhibited panels of the AIDS quilt. So um, what they did was during Converge, during two weeks of the show, they had 11 panels, here they are, that exhibited at Metro Health Hospital. And then we also had art in their um, gallery, which is one of their main hallways. Um, another big part of, you know, the quilt is we decided to make a quilt square from the artists of Converge for the artists that aren't here. You know, just really realizing how many artists that we had lost through that um, pandemic, <laughs> epidemic. And um, so we will have a quilt square that is from the artists of Converge that will be added to the National Memorial AIDS quilt. 
um, which I am so happy about. Um, and then here's some pictures of the opening, you know, and like I said, again, you know, it's, everyone's had a hard couple of years and just to see so many smiles, it really brought a community together. And during this time when, you know, a lot of times we couldn't meet in person or, you know, artists were nervous to have us in their studio. Um, it really was a connection. This piece here, Melissa Bloom, one of the artists, she wanted to paint five inch by five inch portraits of every artist in the show. Um, and when we had an event at the center, this is hanging at the center. Um, the artists just love to go up there, their little portrait um, and kind of point to it. So I just love those. And again, you know, it just mimics how happy the community was um, that we were able to do what we did, especially now during these times. Um, and I'm just gonna finish up with, I feel that Cleveland did a great job. We were on the channel three, there was a lot of different um, scene magazine and current magazine and can magazine, you know, can journal. Um, they really picked up on Converge. And then ending with, we had a wonderful dog class with Joyce Morrow Jones. And um, you can just see how it just tied it all together. And um, so I know it went quick and I know. <laughs> You couldn't focus on a lot of those images, but I just wanted to give you a little taste of, you know, what we went through the last year. And um, again, we're a staff of three. So I think um, it was pretty amazing. And I couldn't be more proud of the artist archives for um, what we pulled off, <laughs> really. So with that, um, I'm going to introduce Tom Rose. He is one of the artists at Kendall and we're gonna get his slideshow up and I'm gonna mute myself and give it to Tom. Thanks so much, Kelly. Um, that was a terrific uh, video. I actually saw my studio in there and a few other things, plus one of my, my, my little portrait by Mary. Uh, so that was fun. I actually, Kelly, can go to the next slide. And I thought it would be a good opportunity to deconstruct uh, my two drawings that are in the exhibit at Kendall, uh, which we wouldn't be able to do in the gallery at all. I can't pull the layers off once they're on. But um, my drawings are all pretty much about people. Although oftentimes you don't see any people, but the uh, architecture represents them. Um, they're also short stories and uh, sometimes the architecture or the elements in the drawing represent ele uh, par uh, characters in the story. Also, each of my drawings usually starts with sort of an informal checklist. I uh, have three things on that checklist. And one thing is um, how, complicated and technically difficult is the drawing going to be. I, I look at it as there's no point in doing a drawing unless it's going to be a real big challenge and going to be very difficult. If it's easy, why bother doing it? Also uh, on the checklist is will it have a compelling story of some sort that might be implied by the title or enhanced by the title? And the third thing is I usually try to have something in the drawing that's going to entertain me uh, my, maybe a personal joke uh, that the viewer won't under, you know, uh, realize that it was for my pleasure. So if we look at the far left, that's uh, the drawing uh, spring driveway that's in the exhibit. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, and uh, that is the stage of the drawing when all of it is completely covered with graphite. It's, it really could be considered a finished drawing at that point. Uh, there is some white colored pencil applied for the clouds and uh, a few details on some of the houses and a little bit of blue at the top of the sky to enhance the depth of the sky when I apply the paint. Um, so at that point, it really could be a finished drawing, but it's um, more exciting, I think, with the color. Uh, 
The next drawing to the right, where the cursor is now, is that same drawing, but with layers of transparent to translucent acrylic paint applied, thin enough that I can see the uh, graphic drawing below. I don't want to lose that drawing completely. I spent a lot of time doing it. I don't want to um, have it not um, be present. And then the drawing to the uh, right is the completed drawing that you've seen in the exhibit. And uh, it's finished off with um, colored pencil to enhance the texture or, read, uh, or more thoroughly define the details. Uh, this one was drawn during the pandemic, and it was um, kind of a representation, in, as far as I'm concerned, that was a, a perhaps cold, but still bright, sunny spring day. And it would be an opportunity for people to, stump, to start coming out of their houses to compare notes as to how their neighbors might have fared during the uh, pandemic days. So perhaps talking over the fence or pulling weeds or cutting grass or something and getting a sense of community again and coming out and emerging into the sunshine. If we could go to the next slide then, Kelly. This is the other drawing that's at the Kendall exhibit and uh, it's the same procedure here. The drawing way to the left is uh, the graphite stage when it's all covered with graphite. This one has, it looks like a little bit more um, introduction of the white colored pencil. Again, it's mostly so that I can find my way a little bit easier. The one in the center is with all the thin washes of transparent to translucent acrylic paint applied over the whole surface, which by the way, when, when um, the watery paint goes across the graphite, it seals the graphite and it, it, um, keeps, it, from, it keeps it from coming off as powder. Uh, recently, I discovered, and this is kind of nice, it really helps my process. Some of the real complicated areas, I will paint with clear water first just to seal the graphite so it doesn't keep dredging up into the, uh, into the color. And then the drawing on the right is the finished drawing again with uh, color pencil. This one also was done during the uh, pandemic and it was done after Kelly and I talked about being in the Converge exhibit. And I felt that this represented um, the life of gay people who are sort of compartmentalized in these little boxes or little houses in this kind of architecturally void uh, development. And um, if, if, if you're gay and closeted, you're, you're stuck inside and you can't, you can't share your secret and, and you have a, you know, that burden to carry with you. Um, and then the, the um, thing that amused me in the, is in the foreground, that sort of bundle of um, utility things. And it also represents um, a graveyard or tombstones for um, people that we've lost to AIDS. And that concludes my part. Thanks, Tom. I will stop sharing and turn it over to Mindy and Mark Howard. Oh, thanks, Kelly. Um, my turn to share my screen. So um, mm -hmm. we're going to see some images by Mark. The, they are the ones that are in the show um, at Kendall's that he can talk about. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, we have here these four images of the Virgin Mary that I um, believe I started these in 2019. And uh, they were just really sort of a, uh, a project that I gave myself of just wanting to paint pictures of uh, the Virgin Mary and the child, which I really had started painting quite a long time ago, really. You know, and I just kind of re, re brought that up again in the past uh, uh, so years ago. And it originally started with, uh, I wanted to simplify the image of the um, Virgin Mary, as you see on the bottom too, where there were no features. So that really at that point, I just wanted to just uh, block in uh, shapes and colors, very much like, uh, icons and Russian icons. A lot of these are based on, on icons. And it's kind of funny, as I recall, I believe it was in the mid seventies. And I painted my first picture of uh, the Virgin Mary. It was a black Madonna. 
And it was kind of based on the Russian icons and the Polish icons of the Virgin Mary. And my mother and I, we got it framed and it's sitting in the home and everything. It just looked odd just sitting in the home. So we thought that my mother said, well, why don't you donate it to church, our church, Blessed Sacrament in North New Jersey. And, uh, and so we donated and everything. And the bishop came to give mass that day. And there was a, pr a pr procession going up the aisle and the two altar boys had my painting walking down the aisles and it was just the most surreal thing I had ever seen and they placed it on an easel at the altar so I was just staring at this thing throughout the whole mass and then afterwards I just thought this is just weird and then this little old lady came up I never saw this little old lady before in my life she came out of nowhere and she knelt in front of my painting and lit a candle I just lost it at that point because then I kind of realized that it was just out of my hands. It, it was something else. And, and so, you know, at that stage of doing religious artwork, it kind of just, it was just a part of me. And then when I came to Cleveland, to the Cleveland Institute of Art and everything, you know, I just kind of went through all the basics and everything. And that type of imagery kind of fell by the wayside, but it never really, you know, left me. And so I, brought it back up in 2019. And I think that was just the beginnings of when the COVID was starting to surface. And uh, it was a way for me to just keep myself focused. And so I did a Virgin Mary a day. And they started very simple and I just used scraps. I wanted to work small and uh, I used scraps of what I had around the studio. And I just kept doing them each day and each day. And they progressed to different uh, formats. Some are very expressionistic. Some are very uh, flat planes of color. And then later on, as you would see in the top two, I actually started to put features onto them. And also I uh, wanted to work with the idea of fragments. Um, if something is torn away. And so I would start the, the process of just tearing up uh, papers and then creating, putting the image onto that um, and not have the image dictate what the edge was going to interact with it. So for a lot of them, they look as though they are torn or fallen off or, or that maybe they're chips. And uh, so that's where um, these four images uh, started from. And as a, it's funny because at the end, they became um, a little bit more freer. Uh, some became even much more abstract, uh, but I kept to the same formats. And that was kind of important for me, uh, same format of uh, positioning and everything. And with the exceptions of some of them are more painterly, or much more simplified in terms of shapes. And uh, at the last, I decided to um, turn some of them into ornaments for Christmas. And that was fun. And uh, but very much in the same manner as, that, as the bottom left. And uh, they were pretty much experimentations in color. Uh, and how the color interacts with one another. And, that, and those were really, there was 200 images of, of the Virgin Mary for that year. And then uh, my work kind of progressed to being more abstract. And uh, now the figure is kind of banished from my work. It's more uh, shapes and colors and how they interact. But I will make one exception for the Virgin Mary. So, Every Christmas, she she gets her due. 
<laughs> yeah, I, you know, I saw these images um, of Marx when I was um, picking out work for the Scene on Scene show, what hap which happened in 2019 here. And, um, and it literally um, there was, I, I don't know if you had 200 at that point, but it sure seemed like it. It even seemed like more than 200. They were Little boxes. Amazing. Yeah, there were boxes and boxes. He kept pulling out boxes in the studio saying, oh, look, here's another box. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like pull out all these, these beautiful paintings. Um, they're, they're just amazing. Mark is, uh, he's a fantastic colorist as a painter. I mean, I, his paintings are just beautiful. And um, and uh, is your show still up at the work that you have at the Akron Art Museum? Is that yes. still up? Yes. yes. Okay. So Mark has has work at the Akron Art Museum, which you you might want to just mention that. Yes. That show. Um, there's a, a it's a group show at the Akron Art Museum, and I believe it it continues through March. And it's a a show of a Northeast Ohio artist, and there are different approaches to um, painting, but not everything is a painting. Uh, there's drawings, there are, I believe there's some textiles, and the premise of the show is kind of like a, a, diff, a sensory overload, uh, almost Baroque in a weird way of how artists, um, as opposed to having a very minimalist approach to picture making, um, attach more and more to a surface to enliven it and, and how it responds to um, contemporary issues and about identity and surface and whatnot. And I have uh, 30 pieces in that show and they were pretty much in the same format of shape as the two images of the Virgin Mary on the top where I was dealing with fragments and scraps of canvas and um, producing uh, abstract um, canvases on them, and uh, it was it was it, you know I didn't create for the show. It was just something that I did to keep myself busy during the pandemic months and everything. And so I had them all in a box. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the curator at Akron, uh, Sima Ray, came over and picked those uh, specifically for the show. So I was really pleased. And they're all on burlap. So that was, you know, these lockdown periods were a way for me to kind of uh, experiment on different surfaces and, and different approaches. Oh, great. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, so I think Arnie is our next, Ar Arnie Tunstall is our next artist who's up. Um, he's going to show you work um, that goes a little bit beyond also what is in your show at Kendall. And um, so Arnie, if you'd like to come on, we can um, start. I'm here. Here's, okay, let's go to the next screen. There we go. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, hello, everybody. Uh, this exhibition is in uh, at Kendall, correct? Yes, yes, okay. it is. Um, and this is, I was really thrilled when, when uh, Kelly and, and Mindy uh, wanted to show this one because uh, I've never shown it. I, was, I, I made it right after grad school. So this is 1991, uh, feels like a lot, <laughs> several lifetimes ago. Um, and it's a portrait I took in the subway holding my plastic camera out of me with the poster for um, Silence of the Lambs um, behind me, because I've always been uh, a, a huge fan of Jodie Foster. We're the same age, and she's uh, someone who I, I was just attracted to in the past. And then as I, I became older and recognized that she was a queer person, um, she became a, even a bigger hero for me. So I was really glad to, for this uh, image to be uh, out of my, literally out of my closet uh, and on the walls finally, thank you. Uh, so let's do the next one. And I chose another one that's that's older um, to maybe give that other one um, some context for you. Uh, this isn't in the exhibition, but it's a piece that I've always loved that's also um, made uh, after grad school um, and sort of to tells you a little bit about how I work. I, um, 
I'm a dinosaur. I'm still using black and white film in old cameras and can't get away from it. I just love it. And my my artistic heroes are people like Robert Frank and uh, Walker Evans and uh, Lee Friedlander. Um, and I like to just find things out there in the world. Um, and uh, like Tom said, I I don't usually or or try and actively uh, avoid having people in my pictures, uh, which is um, I guess unusual for a lot of people, but um, I really like to still do portraits of a place, portraits of a city or portraits of myself, but have that representation by just sort of things I find out there in the world. And this is a uh, beauty shop in Pittsburgh that I just loved because looking at this image, it could be 1965 or like it was, which was 1993. Okay, we can do the next one. And these are three of the images that are in uh, the exhibition that represent a couple of different kinds of ways of working for me. Um, uh, the image on the left, uh, which is a globe. Uh, I'm also a um, collector. Um, my husband would call me a hoarder. I have lots of things around me that I, I sort of keep them until I can photograph them or put them somewhere. Um, and then I feel like I can release them because they've kind of served their purpose. And this um, little old globe that was damaged, uh, it's not that little actually, it's a relatively big one, is just sitting on the a cement floor of a friend's um, studio. And for me, it looked like it was sort of floating in outer space or drifting. And the globe was damaged, all those sort of white marks in the, um, what should be uh, the uh, Arctic Sea are all sort of missing bits of paper from the globe. And um, this is 2009. And I've been thinking about, uh, what's happening to the natural world and climate change and things. And so that felt to me like a very nondescript and sort of quiet uh, comment on that. Um, I, I don't think of myself as a documentarian or even a nature photographer, but I am always attracted to the natural world. Um, and the, the central piece is a Japanese maple. Um, and this uh, was when I was traveling with my family and this maple is hundreds of years old. It's on an actual plantation in Northern Virginia, which we were touring and the sort of gravity of, of that property and what that place had stood for and what had happened there um, really affected me. And I'm laying on the ground underneath this Japanese maple. It's one of those ones that sort of swoops down almost like an umbrella. And I was laying beneath it to sort of get that um, look up at it. And for me, I'm attracted to this because it doesn't quite even look like a tree. It looks more like a capillary system or some uh, something microscopic, which I, I, I love how photography can um, trick us. And the piece on the right is from the High Line um, in uh, New York City. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's sort of an elevated park that's been built on a decommissioned uh, elevated uh, train line in, in Manhattan. And it, it had just opened or just been open for a couple of years when I took this and they have put uh, natural um, growing plants and things along the, the uh, now defunct rail lines and there's a, a place to walk. And for me, it was a way to look at the city in a new way. I've been photographing, traveling to and photographing New York City for almost 40 years and am endlessly intrigued by um, the amount of visual information that's in any big city, but especially that one. And I also love coming across um, pop culture and this um, uh, billboard uh, uh, just beyond the, um, the High Line uh, with this woman's face and then these weeds up close. Uh, I was uh, really attracted to that um, unintentional sort of architectural juxtaposition. Okay, let's look at the next one. And here's uh, uh, New York again. This uh, image I took in 2016, but I didn't print it um, until a few years later. And I call this Handbag Fifth Avenue. And this is on Fifth Avenue on a side street. And I showed this at the Can Triennial in 2018. And I was really proud of the fact that several people asked me um, what this was and how I, they, they all assumed it was a collage which I'm really happy about because this is just something I happened upon. I'm standing on the street. This is across the street. My husband's behind that van waiting for me um, impatiently. Um, and there's some people walking towards us. So those little humans on the right are, are for scale. The van is real and that 
woman holding the handbag is an ad that's four or five stories tall. So I love when that kind of thing can happen where layers of visual information, uh, and we're so bombarded with visual information in our world um, and be able to do something to sort of stop that and, and make you look at it and wonder, um, you know, what are we doing to ourselves and why is this world so crazy? So it's, it's something that has always attracted me and I, I, I can't stop myself. Anytime I see something like this, I have to uh, stop and take a picture. Um, okay, let's do, I think this is, there's one last one. Yeah. And this is the Canfield Fair, um, which uh, my husband and I have been going to uh, for 30 plus years. Um, every year I, I seem to repeat myself uh, <laughs> uh, like crazy when I'm there. And for me, it's like going to New York City or Las Vegas. It's just such a, a um, county fairs in Ohio are amazing and full of visual overload. And being someone who studied art and shown art and worked in art museums for most of my career, I love when I come across some good, bad art. And this um, Mona Lisa that you can stick your face in and get your picture uh, taken uh, was super attractive to me. And to have it be sort of, <laughs> I, that's my husband's arm there. I told him just to stand next to it because I wanted, I wanted it without anyone's face in it. Um, and uh, I just wanted to leave you with something that was a little, uh, funny to me anyway. <laughs> so that's all I wanted to really show, uh, just a few sides of uh, who I am as a photographer and sort of um, put the, the few works that are in the exhibition at Kendall uh, in a little bit of context for you. Oh, thanks, Arnie. That was um, pretty amazing. Um, I'll have questions later when they learn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's great. Thank you all very, very much. Um, what we'll do now is start our question and comment uh, period. For those of you who may not have been here at the beginning, if you have a question, please unmute yourself, ask it, and then mute yourself again while whoever you're talking to answers. And who would like to go first? Well, I'll go first. Go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll start. Um, so, you know, um, um, you, you talked a little bit, Arnie, about, you know, the things that you find special in photography. When I look at your work and I see it, um, yeah, you do a lot of really magical things with the photographs that I think takes, takes you out of the realistic part of the photograph and puts you into a different kind of landscape, you know, playing with perspective, um, like the photograph, the last one with the, the van in front of the photograph, which the photograph looks like it's actually really happening um, while you're right there, you know, like a real person is huge. So is that kind of the basis of your work? You know, the reflections in the, in the windows and all of that, it just, it, um, I, I'm gonna use the word surreal. I'm not sure that they're surreal, but I think when I say that, people would understand what I mean by that. Um, but anyway, do you want to just talk about that a little more? Sure. Yeah, there's a bit of that, but that's not something I, I, I'm going for. I, I, I love to investigate what the camera does and the fact that we see so much and process so much um, so quickly that we often don't sort of stop and look at the layers and the reflections and the absurdities of things. And so that's what I try and do. And for me, why I've stuck with black and white for so long is removing color also adds to the hyper reality or the illusion of something being real when it's not. I'm also really attracted to we as Americans, especially in humans in general that make fake things like bad fake stone and, you know, imitation things. And I'm always thinking, you're not fooling me. This is bad. I can tell that it's not real. Um, but when, once you photograph it, sometimes that layer and then maybe making it black and white, they look more real even. And so that's something I, I think about often. I try to not think too much when I'm shooting um, and be a little um, open to what's out there. But um, I often can't help myself if I see a, a shop window or something layered, I, I have to uh, catch it. Does that answer your question? Yes, actually, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Great. Somebody else? <laughs> Who has a question? 
do. I'm wondering how the pandemic has changed how you're looking at things. Like Tom, you're not in the New York City and able to do that most likely. Um, how has it, it certainly has affected everyone's lives. Has it affected your art? Well, since you mentioned my name, I'll jump in first, I guess. Uh, it hasn't changed our life very much at all, <laughs> which is pretty depressing, I guess. We, we don't go anywhere or do anything. But we were, you know, we did go to Europe at least once a year, every usually every November and visit a lot of art museums and that sort of thing. So we're missing that. But in terms of working in the studio, it's intensified it for me uh, because there's a few, there, sort of less distraction. You know, it's go to the studio, come home, go to the studio, come home, uh, eliminated uh, the gym and that sort of thing. Um, I did and will continue to do uh, as the one drawing I showed you of the little boxes. Um, there are some developments near where we live. And the days that we weren't doing our three to five mile daily forced march in the metro parks, we would walk in the developments. And I've been doing a series of drawings from those um, uh, endeavors. Um, and as, in, as I indicated in that other drawing, it's kind of architecturally vacuous. And when you are in Cleveland on gray, damp days walking for miles when you're scared because of the pandemic, you start to see more and more and more of bleakness and bleakness and bleakness. So I, I, I've done quite a few drawings for, based on that and I will continue to do that. They are kind of difficult for me. It's emotionally difficult and um, some of them are large. They're 30 by 40 basically and it's pretty much a blank wall of the side of a house usually. And the whole drawing is just that. And it's tricky to manipulate or uh, work with the paint. When I'm putting it down in transparent washes, it's difficult to control that amount of space. So I don't know, I hope that answers your question, but for us, our life hasn't changed a, a whole lot. Mm -hmm. It's just a little bit more intense working in the studio. How about for you, Mark? Me. That's you. I uh, <laughs> well, likewise for me, uh, you know, when the pandemic came around, you couldn't go anywhere. You couldn't, you know, everything was closed. Galleries, museums, you know, uh, it was just locked down. And so for me, it really, it gave me the best time to just go crazy in a hmm. good sense and to um, create all of this works of art that normally I just, you know, just wouldn't have all that time, you know, just do the, the various things that one does every day just to, to keep going. You know, when the pandemic came, I could get up at eight in the morning and create and continue creating until midnight. And that would go on to the next day, the next day. So things really did intensify and it gave me a lot of uh, opportunities just to go outside of the, of the box of, of how I would normally create things. And it gave me the license to just go, go crazy with things. It's just like, well, you can't do anything else. So you might as well just expand the way that you see <laughs> things. And so in that respect, um, for me at least, that lockdown was like a wonderful time, um, just artistic wise, you know, that I could just um, almost kind of redefine how I want to see things and how I create things. And, and it hasn't stopped. It kind of um, created this whole new uh, discipline of uh, creating works of art um, every day, you know, and uh, I've, I've done many preliminary sketches, which, you know, years ago I didn't really do. And uh, this year, um, there's been a much more emphasis on the abstract, and I really have kind of banished figural elements from my work. And uh, it was just a wonderful way, a challenge for me. So that, you know, 
it was a good thing for me, at least in that respect. And for you, Arnie? Um, for me, it, it wasn't great. I, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I, I get most of my sort of creative juices out when I leave town or get away from the house and I was stuck. And that's no, not normally where I work. Um, I, I really get the work done by sort of being out with my camera. So I was incredibly frustrated and, and depressed, you know, like a lot of people. Um, so I, I sort of got over that and started photographing uh, at home um, because that was, you know, where I was and did a lot of photography with my phone and did um, some small color works, which I have yet to produce uh, or show. Uh, I'm still sort of thinking about them. Um, and I think a lot of artists are uh, constipated by sort of what they've <laughs> done over the last two years. And we're, we're gonna be, I'm so excited for what we're gonna see in the coming couple of years and, and for what I'm going to produce because I'm still thinking uh, about, you know, what we've uh, witnessed and have a bunch of uh, film that I've yet to develop. Um, so yeah, it was, it was kind of hard for me um, to get anything done. But like Mark said, I've started some new um, habits that I, I don't wanna let go and I'm, I'm making more time for myself and uh, thinking more about color and, and using, uh, digital um, for uh, coming back to color and digital that I hadn't done in a long time. So um, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Great. Um, some of those who have your hand raised, can you unmute and go ahead and ask your question? Oh, this is Kathy. Um, I wanted to say that I, I was really drawn, Mark, to your paintings of the Madonna and Child. And um, and I think it's partly because about 10, 12 years ago, I had worked a lot with some black uh, Catholic churches who were in the process of merging and, um, and spent a lot of time in those churches. And I looked you up while, I was, uh, while you were talking and I saw some of your background. So I really relate to uh, your your being in Cleveland, I also read that you um, that you did things uh, <laughs> trash cans, and is that right? Yes. Did, yes, <laughs> which I really <laughs> love, and I remember seeing those when I was living in Cleveland. The beautiful cutout, and I think you did something at the uh, airport too. Yes, that's correct. That right? Uh, all of things that I really have enjoyed. So it's been great to meet you and hear you talk about your work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Mark has done quite a number of public commissions, um, public murals that you'll see when you drive around Cleveland. I think mm -hmm. um, Cleveland School for the Arts. Cleveland School for the Arts. Oh, yeah. Uh, Oriana House. Is that about the, did you do something for the Rainey Institute? What's on 55th Street? You know, something on 55th Street. On 55th Street, yeah. that's the Oriana House. The Oriana, okay. The and uh, I did a, a few uh, sculptural projects for um, uh, Brene Jeshurun Synagogue and uh, Cleveland Public Library murals downtown. And that was uh, one of the first public art projects. And, and it has the only gay subject matter. I think it was the first gay subject matter mural wise in the city of Cleveland. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the story of Hyacinth Nicole and um, Apollo. And it has a story about uh, Zephyr, the wind god, got jealous because uh, Apollo was teaching Hyacinth how to throw the discus. And so in a rage of jealousy, he blew the discus back and it struck Hyacinth in the head. And mm -hmm. Apollo was just so grieved that when the blood hit the ground, he decreed that from henceforth, the Hyacinth would spring up as a flower. Mm -hmm. and so that was the subject for that mural. And uh, so that was a a little interesting little thing that I was able to slip under the radar there. Yeah. Well, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. That's, that's but yeah, there's cool. been quite a few public art projects. I don't really do too many of them now because they're, they're just physically, I just can't handle really large, you know, public art 
projects like that. I was able to do that when I was younger and I had, but <laughs> it, it's, I can't do that anymore. So it's really, it's, it's things that, that for me are more on a human scale that I try to do. Mark, this is one of the pieces he had in Converge. What's the title of this? This is one of your cans. Uh, can you spare some change, my brother? Yeah. And um, it was based on seeing homeless uh, men carrying those little tin cups hmm. and uh, begging for um, change and handouts. Hmm. And, um, and so I decided to really kind of turn that trash can in a, in a weird way as a kind of like a symbol of that cup. And the papers that are inside are found letters. And it was a period in Cleveland uh, several years ago where I would just find all of these bizarre found images mm -hmm. and uh, letters written from prison to girlfriends and mothers and everything, just bizarre stuff that only I would find. <laughs> and so I Xeroxed them and I put them in what I used to have home. It was a, a Mary Astor popcorn box. And I call that the can of shame. And it had all of these photographs and fragments of photographs. And it was just very interesting. And so I made artwork from the can of shame. And this trash can is from that period. And all those letters inside are all different letters. Some of them really heart touching and then others are really comical. And it's just a snapshot of Cleveland and all its residents. I see your hand, Anne Francis. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you all for sharing part of that Converge exhibit with us here at Kendall. Um, as an LGBTQ, it's very validating to um, and interesting to see this art and know how widespread that exhibit was. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you for this presentation too. It's very interesting. Um, my question is, um, I was wondering what kind of interaction you all are having with young adults and if there was involvement of young adults in the Converge exhibit. And um, I know as an old adult, I, it, it inspires me to do art, but I wondered with the young people, if they're benefiting from your talents and your art. So we, we did have um, an intern curator, Mary Proctor, she is 16 years old. So um, she kind of shadowed us throughout um, the planning and uh, she came to some of the curators meetings and um, helped select some of the art. And um, so as far as like, um, you know, high school age we had her and then we had um two students from the cleveland institute of art um that were also in the exhibit we were you know me and the other curators were really really conscious of you know just reaching you know the young and the older and um diversifying the collection that we you know brought together yeah, the, um, one of the venues uh, for the Converge exhibit was the LGBT Community Center of Greater Cleveland. And they also have a youth program. Um, and so um, there was interaction between the youth program and the work that was at the LGBT Center. Um, we had originally hoped that we would have more interaction, but unfortunately, um, COVID kind of, you know, put the kibosh on that um, quite a bit. Um, there haven't really been any tours of the archives since 2019 um, because of COVID. And, um, the, you know, the other venue um, that um, I think focused on more youthful art and also was open to more youth was the uh, Lake Erie College. Um, so it was right in Lake Erie College. So the students, uh, definitely, they weren't high school students, but they were young adults. 
Um, they seem to be getting younger every year, let me just say that. <laughs> um, but those, those college students, um, I think at least four classes actually use the exhibit as a teaching experience for the students, so. Yeah, and I wanted to say as, as somebody whose art was hanging at the LGBTQ Center in, in Cleveland, and I went to a couple of events there, there was a lot of young people at the opening. Um, and since I was one of the other old farts in the exhibition, it was really great to see um, so many young people who were experiencing art and experiencing the art of some folks that we've lost who are, uh, we lost to AIDS uh, years ago. Uh, and they're people that I know or knew and I don't want them just to live in my memory, you know, and it's really great that this exhibition now has introduced a whole new generation of people to the legacy of some really great artists in this community who, uh, for whatever reason, sometimes have slipped under the radar. And Kelly, Mindy, thank you so much for um, shining a light on um, all of us uh, and, and projecting it to a, a new generation of of art viewers. So I think it's been incredibly rewarding in that respect. So I, I really appreciate your, your comment. Um, and as somebody who is at a university and surrounded by 19 and 20 year olds who drive me crazy all day long, um, I can tell you that it's been really wonderful to see what's happened to them during the pandemic. They have become uh, engaged and politicized in a way that I am, am really proud and surprised by especially our students of color and especially our students who are on the queer uh, spectrum, they have all become very uh, supportive of each other and really engaged politically. So it's been really exciting to watch that happen. Yeah, you know, one of the reasons, um, well, I, I don't know if it was a reason, but it was something that we discovered that was very exciting of uh, holding this exhibit was that um, there was um, no documentation that I could find of the community of LGBTQ plus artists. You know, there's lots of documentation about things that the community has done, you know, starting a pride parade and, and things like that um, and coming together in different ways and forming the community center, but nothing specifically geared towards the artist. Um, and something that we've been doing that's ongoing that um, Kelly has actively been doing is collecting the oral histories of the artists who were in the exhibition. Um, and I think that's important too. I mean, I think, I, I hope, I hope that this exhibition will be historically important for the future, or at least will be the start of something for the future. I'm sure it will. Um, I just saw a question pop up in the chat that I actually wanted to address when I had the floor. So I'm gonna take it back. Um, it says, how uh, has your identity as an LGBTQ plus person influenced your art? And that's something that I often struggle with because I don't, um, I never considered myself as an artist, someone who, and as a photographer, photographers are supposed to be documentarians or journalists. And that was never me, you know? And I also wasn't taking pictures of, you know, naked men or something that was, you know, very overtly uh, queer. Uh, but I've also had people look at my work and feel um, that there is a sensibility there, you know? And for me, I just always wanted to be true to what I saw and what I felt, and because of that, that's representing my, you know, my identity, uh, and I, I can't help that. Um, and sometimes it comes out in, in ways that I'm not paying attention to, and other people see it sometimes before I do, um, but it's not conscious or overt on my part. And one thing I loved about this exhibition, because there were so many artists in this uh, show, and like, like Tom's work, you don't need to know that he is thinking about the things he's thinking about, but you can feel it when you look at those um, uh, buildings. I, I definitely get a sense of, of, of what he was discussing. So that uh, alienation or the closeness or the bleakness of a Cleveland winter, you know, all those kind of things are, are, are there. So uh, it's not something for me personally that I, I push, but, but it's in my artwork. Uh, I can't help it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to uh, uh, tail that up. I, I think you and I see things pretty much the same way. When you were talking about how, what you're making with your art, I, I, that's pretty much what I see and what I think as well. Uh, certainly not the same, but I think we have a similar sensibility. But I agree, too. I'm an artist and I'm a person. I happen to be gay. And, and it's not something that I have to have like a big banner or you know, paint rainbows all over my drawings or something of that nature. There might be 
something in the title or there might be something in the content or the story behind it, but that doesn't necessarily have to be promoted publicly. Like, like you just said, Arnie, uh, it's, it's something that's sort of implied. You might pick that up. And if you do, that's fine. And if you don't, that probably wasn't my major agenda point anyway. So yeah, I agree with that statement quite, quite a bit. And, it, and it's not something that I, um, I so appreciate artists that are politically active and are capable of doing that. Cause I'm just, I'm not, I'm bad at it. You know, and I've seen Mark's work for decades and love the work that he does, especially when he is, and he, like he, he brought up where he sneaks some things in, you know, um, I, I really appreciate that and, and honor that for sure. Mm -hmm. Would you like to wrap us up, Mark, and say what you have to say about that question and then we'll close? Well, um, like the rest of the artists, uh, you know, I don't really consider myself, you know, a, a gay artist. I'm, I'm an artist and uh, who happens to be gay. And, you know, when I was, when I was younger and creating very figurative work, oftentimes it had a, a homoerotic subject matter or, or, you know, a subject matter that addressed the human body. And that was more apropos for, for you know, that moniker. But now my work doesn't really address the human body per se. And so, you know, I just don't need that hyphenated existence. You know, I just go about my day to day, how I see things. And if some people, I see what they, believe is a queer aesthetic or something, then great. But I don't consciously try to do like, you know, have it neon signs. <laughs> well, I, I think the wonderful thing about this show, about Converge and about what we've had here at Kendall is not so much that these are LGBTQ artists, but a celebration of the fact that there are so many of us doing such wonderful work and that we are out of the shadows, out of the closet, proudly human, proudly artistic, proudly creative. Um, and the fact that there are so many of us and that we are so wonderful, I think is the celebration and, and what I take away from, from that, uh, from both of those exhibits and from our talk today. Thank you all very, very much. It was a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. And um, we will make a YouTube of this and you can send it to all your friends. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.